Welcome to Baseball and Coffee, episode 24 with Tino and Aaron. What's up, Aaron? Not too much. How are you today? I'm good, man. Waking up a little bit, but I'm good. Yeah. I'll let so you know why I said that in a, in a moment here. Um, coffee stories, what you got? Yeah, so I tasted a really uh, rare coffee. It's a Starbucks um, roastery exclusive. Um, we roast and pack, or not roast, but we package coffee for the New York roastery at my job. Um, and uh, they gifted us uh, with a box of Gravitas blend. Um, it has coffees from three different origins and they're processed three different ways. Um, so there's coffees from Ethiopia, Costa Rica, and El Salvador. Well, Ethiopia is a natural processed coffee. Uh, Costa Rica is a honey processed coffee, which we've talked about a few times recently. And El Salvador is washed. So pretty complex cup, a lot of different a lot of different influences on the flavor. Um, I also did a chemix of this coffee and the berry notes really pushed forward um, and really made it um, quite layered and quite bright. Um, I preferred it on a basket brew. Um, it was a lot richer and smoother that way for my personal tastes. Yeah, just a really fantastic coffee and really honestly more complex uh, and one of the more rare coffees um, that I'll have. Did you try it other ways besides basket? Yeah, I did a basket and a chemix. Mm -hmm. Chemex is rough. Chemex is my, it's like the, the, uh, what's the, what is it? like the pot at the end of the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for me, because it's my favorite brew method, but it's also the most difficult one for me to nail. I would make a, well, okay, actually, you know, well it was kind of impromptu. We were grilling out Monday. The first time I grilled this year it was, mm -hmm. we had a couple of storms roll through, but it cleared and I was like, I really want to grill. And I was off that night. And I was waiting for the grill to run up, and I was like, I wanted to sip on some coffee, and I just decided to do it impromptu. Awesome. I thought it, did, I thought it poured well. Um, yeah. Awesome. Or I liked it. I, uh, so here's my, here's my story about waking up. You ever have a moment where the only coffee in the house is decaf? <laughs> I've not, <laughs> not that I can remember. And you're about 15 minutes away from recording a podcast. Well, that was, that's what happened to me today. So drinking decaf, uh, it's interesting because I want to see if there's any, obviously I know that it's decaf, so there's no real placebo effect, but I'm, I do want to see if it has any impact on me at all. The interesting thing is um, that I wanted to bring up about decaf though, is we always used to say that um, the most dedicated uh, coffee drinkers were the decaf drinkers. The regular decaf drinkers because they weren't getting any sort of you know chemical buzz from it but they loved the flavor of coffee that much that it was something that they had to have every morning and um so that when i think of decaf that's the that's literally the first thing i think about which i think sure. is kind of cool so how's the spin on it right so this episode uh we're going to cover uh tgfbi update um a little bit of fan tracks we'll talk about our team's successes and then uh some trades and waiver waiver moves um we're going to review our preseason catcher top 10 and then present a quick uh current catcher top 10 uh, both share a hitting prospect that we did a little bit of a deep dive into that we're excited about um and then if we have time open forum and open some baseball cards so tgfbi we are currently uh fourth we, are, we have 35.5 points in hitting and 62.5 in pitching. Um, we made a couple moves. We replaced Zach Collins with the combination of Cal Raleigh and hopefully down the road, Gabriel Moreno. And our hitting, while it's um, almost half of half of scoring of our pitching, we're still waiting on Votto, O'Neill Cruz, and um, Ronald Acuna to start producing. So what are your thoughts about our last week in TGFBI and kind of where we're at? Yeah. Yeah, on our pickups, I, I hope we don't re regret not picking up Compisano just because Moreno is not hitting as well as he did last year. But time will tell. I still, I still think the process is right. We'll see about the result. Um, because with Jansen coming back, um, there wasn't much opportunity in the, for the Toronto catcher, that, Toronto catcher that we had. Yeah, hitting-wise, I continue to be a little bit, um, yeah, flummoxed. Last week, we had Royce Lewis and Kevin Smith. We entered it into our lineup for low dollar bids. Um, both of them performed uh, quite well and gave us some production. Whereas before we had holes in our lineup due to players, um, you know, uh, being ill with COVID and getting hurt in the middle of the week. So 
yeah, to not make up any ground hitting wise, um, while having a full lineup was a little surprising to me. Um, but I still feel good about our lineup. And I think we knew catcher was going to be an area we were going to invest in to improve, but um, getting better production from rough, waiting on Bada, like you said, I uh, still really feel good about our outfield with J-Rod, Acuna, Schwarber, Brandon Marsh, um, Andrew Vaughn at Util. So, um, yeah, I feel good about it. I think we just have to stay the course and are encouraged by, of course, the pitching has been the backbone so far. And I think we really have are in a great place with the bullpen. Mm-hmm having three, three closers who have legit skill and have, uh, to me, like every day that passes their role seem more secure. Mm-hmm. We did get a homer from Cal Raleigh last night, which was, I saw that. I feel like any, any production from catcher two, really from either catcher position is, is kind of icing on the cake for us. Um, we just for, to rewind a little bit, we went into the draft looking at um, not drafting a catcher too high or over, I guess, over slot or over mm. where we thought those catchers should be valued. And we had made the mistake in NFBC of, I think, drafting Will Smith a round or two higher than maybe we should have. And so there was a lesson that we tried to take into TGFBI um, is, is kind of waiting on catcher and valuing it, not, not jumping on the run. And uh, so that left us with Elias Diaz as our number one, which we thought was a decent upside play given his park and some of his numbers last year. And he's proven to be, you know, okay. I don't know if yeah, I'd, I'd much prefer him to be our catcher too. Yeah. But we're still, we, we understood that we were going to have to invest some of our um, fab money into the catcher position, trying to find uh, a second catcher. And hopefully this last round of, of uh, waiver claims, um, helped us in solidifying that position. It's, it's most definitely our weakest position on the team. Yeah, and at low cost too. Yes. And other bids wise, and the big, you know, the big players this week were Kirby and Thomas. I think that was pretty widespread. You know, any any pod that you listen to, uh, recapping this weekend's uh, Fab, you know, those are the guys that were the big ticket items. They went for one seventy seven for Kirby in our league and one sixty nine for Thomas. We decided not to invest heavily in those uh, areas. We're leading the league in steals right now. So Alec Thomas didn't seem like a worthy investment. And we're also uh, number one in whip, uh, number one in strikeouts and very good in ERA. So while we think highly of Kirby, also didn't seem like the right investment for us to lean in and try to get those guys. Right. Um, we spent about half of our fab money already. So squirreling that away a little bit and certainly not spending it in a, in a um, place of strength until unless we were planning on picking up Kirby for, you know, to be able to um, uh, just as reinforcements, but yeah, it made sense to keep the money. Yeah. And, and, and most of that money was spent trying to fix our bullpen, which again, I think we've invested a lot churning to try to get the right mix. And, but I think now we're in a spot where we're four saves away from being in third place and saves. Right. Uh, and that would be very impactful in the standings, obviously. So I feel, you know, again, we've invested there, but I think there has been some return on that investment. But yeah, we do have to be mindful of what we're spending as a result. Right. So, but yeah, proud of this team in fourth right now. I think ascending. I don't see a lot of places where we're getting production that we didn't anticipate. I think we did. We did get lucky with some of the the upside plays like Cease and Musgrove and um, some of the others. But Lux. Lux, absolutely. But there. But we. Uh, I think there's nowhere to go but up for us, even in fourth place, yeah. which is pretty cool. I think the only, I mean, the only place I can say, I mean, I think Manny is off to a great start, um, and but I don't think he's going to fall off. But I think he probably won't keep up this week. So I, th- I think everyone right. else has ceiling right. that still to still to uh, climb. Right. That's exciting. Even someone like Darren Ruff, who we've had in the lineup literally every day. Um, has not played, obviously he's gotten off to a slow start, but he's a, a good player who hits it at a pretty good place in the lineup for the, for the Giants. Lindor has cooled off quite a bit. Um, Schwarber hasn't really, you know, he's hit for power, but he hasn't really uh, hit for much else yet. Uh, Cattell Marte has just started getting hot, but, you know, he had a hor- horrendous start as well. So there's just, yeah, there's a lot of potential on this team still. Yeah. Super exciting. Yep. Fan tracks. How'd you do last week? I had a really good week offensively. Um, I feel like a lot of positive regression hit all at once for my team. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a double matchup week. So in our dynasty league, we have, it's a head to head format. 
and um, we get matched up every other week during the season with two teams just to get more exposure and you know, more opportunity um, and just more, I think, more dynamic intrigue in terms of your your matchups, keep it interesting type thing. Yes, yeah, so I went 12 and two in both my matchups, um, really swept it on the hitting side, um, 7-0, 7-0, which to this point in the season has been a struggle for me. Um, but yeah, my team had an 886 OPS. And then pitching wise, um, my starters, with the exception of uh, Musgrove and Sandy, um, my starters got hit pretty hard and my bullpen struggled to get opportunities. So I uh, had more of a struggle on the pitching side than I've had, but still was able to secure enough categories to go again, 12 and two on both spots. But I think fortunate uh, my opponents also had some of the same pitching issues and my offense really, really got healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, my team last week, um, I went uh, 24, three and one total. Um, again, double matchup like Aaron was talking about. Uh, Colton Wong has been a surprise for me. You know, he was somebody who got off to a little bit of a slow start, and I had thought about, you know, replacing him somehow. And I looked at second baseman across the league. I actually made an offer for Marcus Semien, even though his his uh, savant page is ice cold. But um, stuck with Wong mostly because the the Semien offer was rejected and. Glad that I did because he had a phenomenal week last week. He is proving to be the 15 home or 15 steal second baseman that that I was hoping he would be. Yuan Mokata came back. It's really nice to have him back. He provided a couple of homers and he's also watching him. You know, he's he's just a, a powerful player. I think that he's going to really heat up as it warms up. I actually expect 25 to 25 home runs from him this year, the way he's looked thus far. And then uh Julio Rodriguez, Buxton, and Contreras just continue to, well, Buxton and Contreras specifically continue to light it up. And uh, J-Rod and his stolen bases. And, you know, I think he's hitting close to 300 over the last couple of weeks. And um, so my offense round rounded into form similar to yours. I always expected, you know, towards the end of the week for to get a bunch of bad performances in a row just because it's, you know, we all feel like we're snake bitten, but they continue to hit. And then pitching wise, you know, I have, as you know, my rotation is, you know, Rodon and Scherzer and Wheeler and, uh, and then. Uh, Ray and yeah, sorry, Logan Gilbert, Robbie Ray, um, George Kirby. And I was looking for another starter because I wanted to add a seventh, um, you know, for uh, strategic purposes. And I took the two that I had identified this was a couple of weeks ago that I identified were Ranger Suarez and, Mar- and Martin Perez as Perez as one that's kind of under the radar because we don't associate good pitching with him because he has had some pretty poor years, even though he was a top prospect about, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. But the uh, Texas stadium is, is I think um, under the radar enormous. And so pitchers are thriving in Texas and uh, Perez seemed to be thriving. And I looked at, you know, under the hood a bit, and he seemed to be um, kind of pitching, you know, similar stuff to what he's always had, but it's playing better in that park. And I think he's a better pitcher now with experience. And that's proven to be a good pickup And Ranger Suarez as well, who was very vastly underperforming his, um, his draft status. But uh, again, looking under the hood, the stuff was the same. It was a location and pitch sequence thing. And so I picked him up as well. Um, I saw Ranger pitch and just I was watching the movement and watching the swings and he was, he, I, I like him a lot. So pick those two up that really gave me quite a bit of depth and really happy that I did, especially with the news with Scherzer last night. But I think that carried me um, last, uh, last week quite a bit. And then I got three saves from David. Strikeout Hutt. total was really high. What was that? Strikeout total was really high. Right. Almost a hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, Bednar gave me three saves and Ryan Tapera who gave me three holds who I was cursing earlier this week when he gave up five runs and in zero innings. Um, but overall a great week. Uh, I'm net currently, you're currently in first and I'm currently in third in our 16 team league. Um, feels pretty good. It's early on. So just got to keep, you know, keep building, but uh, great week last week. And it's always fun when you start to see those big numbers for sure. I'm excited talking about Contreras when we get to catchers. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, I um, think so there were a couple of trades in our league. Um, I'll start off. Uh, hey, real quick, Tino, yeah. I want to highlight a couple of things on my team before we move on. All right, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
I was going to say about the standings, I think um, for me, one of the important strategy elements or just the way to, to navigate head to head, which has been an adjustment for me. I grew up, uh, grew up, but I, I came to fantasy baseball in a roto format. So this, mm -hmm. this format is new to me, but I think the importance of just like stacking winning weeks, um, finding ways and categories that you can consistently compete at and kind of, I don't say rely on because it's baseball. You're not going to win all the categories every week that you think you excel, but having categories that you uh, make a priority or that you build your team around owning. And then just, and the benefit of that is it keeps you closer to having like a winning or 500 week every week. And then when you have these weeks where things go your way and you have that big performance, it can really help you climb up. And I feel like that's, that's the way I kind of approach it. And when I have these good weeks, I just kind of take it as a positive, but I don't expect it because most weeks are going to be a grind. Um, yeah, to, to your point about hitting, I had um, six guys have over 850 OPS last week. Wow. Uh, Tyler Stevenson uh, had a 1,091 OPS. Christian Walker had 1,000. Uh, Hassan Kim had an 858. Uh, Seager hit three home runs and had 966 OPS. Uh, Yelich hit um, a home run and had a 953 OPS. And then Otani had 10 hits, six runs, four home runs, 10 RBIs, a stolen base, and a 1,200 OPS. He also gave me uh, six yes. innings of six innings uh, with one earned run, two hits, two walks, and five Ks against the Rays. On a night he really didn't have a swing and miss stuff, mm -hmm. he still put up six innings of one run ball for me. Um, but for me, my highlighted second baseman, uh, my mirror image here, Colton Wong, was Gene Segura continues to be a speed out of his mind. He had a 13 game hit streak and yesterday he was 0 for 4. But last week I uh, had uh, nine runs, three home runs, seven RBIs, three steals, and a 1300 OPS. Um, I made the mistake of sitting him against Max Scherzer on Monday last week and he had a home run. Uh, so, <laughs> needless to say, I didn't take him out for the rest of the week. And, and, uh, and he, he uh, rewarded me for that, for that consistency. And then Sunday, I was going into the to Sunday, I had a narrow lead in ratios, and Joe Musgrove was facing the Braves. And they were the the peacock game of the week, which I'm coming to really like. Um, Me too. Being on, being on the East Coast, having our early game, earlier game is is really wonderful, and I really enjoy Benetti on the broadcast. Um, getting accustomed to him with the White Sox, and he's doing those games, so it's just uh, just getting more familiar with his work. But Musgrove was really solid for me, and that put me in a great position in the afternoon. And then I had an outstanding performance from Ashby to kind of close my day out. He uh, pitched four innings, piggybacking or following Brandon Woodruff. Um, I don't necessarily know that they plan to use him for four innings, but he pitched so well, I just left him in. But he went four innings, only gave up one hit, had eight strikeouts, um, and got a save. So he gave me uh, eight strikeouts, a save, and and really just cemented ratios and almost won me three categories. And this was a week after he had a, a quite a terrible start the prior Sunday, and he's kind of been in that hybrid role, and he was a player who was on the cut line for our keeper list and a player that I believed in long term, so I decided to hold. So. Uh, it was nice to get a little affirmation, a little confidence, you know, in his ability as he's kind of been up and down this year, but also just have someone come in late in the day on Sunday and kind of drop a hammer on three categories. I, on a, again, on a guy who I'm invested in long term was pretty, pretty awesome, pretty fun. What's his um, long term role? Do you think? Or what do I you think, think his best long, long term role is? I see him uh, following kind of a Freddie Peralta path. Uh, eventually, you know, I think they see him as a starter and uh, I think he'll work towards that, but I think he'll have to earn that. But I think we're also entering a role, entering a time where there's just more role ambiguity with pitching and how much the Brewers embrace that. We'll, you know, we'll see. Um, I think they're one of the savvier pitching teams uh, in, in, in the major, in major, in the major leagues. And that's one of the reasons why I held Ashby, honestly. Um, is my ability to, or my belief and their ability to get the most out of him and help him refine his arsenal, improve his command, uh, throw the right sequence and that kind of thing. Um, I really believe in their ability to do that. I, I'm sure you heard it too yesterday. I heard something really interesting on um, rates and barrels about kind of looking at a pitcher, not as a certain number of inning pitcher, but more what, what is their average number of pitches and using that as a way to understand who that pitcher is, right? And so, um, yes, there's there's fantasy value in you know whether a pitcher starts the game or finishes the game or pitches in the middle of the game, but I think as far as you know um, how long that pitcher goes, looking at you know starting to look at okay, what is this team 
when is this team pulling this pitcher? Is he a, a 45 pitch pitcher? Is he an 80 pitch pitcher? Is he a 90 pitch pitcher? The other interesting stat that, that they shared yesterday that blew me away is that there's no starter um, this year that averages over a hundred pitches per start. Mm. This just doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that has a, an, uh, an enormous impact on fantasy, right? Because yeah. volume is so important and wins are so important. And so um, in my mind that, that further increases the value of the pitchers, the starting pitchers who are able to go five, more than five innings and the starting pitchers that are, are consistent, right? So um, I was just looking at my team from last week and I was thinking about, you know, Robbie Ray has been not the Robbie Ray of 2021. You know, his stuff was better yesterday or in, in his last start, but he's still not quite there yet, but he's racking up a ton of strikeouts. And so, you know, he got me 19 strikeouts last week in two starts, but his uh, ERA was 5.5. 5.40. Now his whip was 1.029. So he pitched well and he got two wins. But the argument I'm making is if I can surround a pitcher like Ray, who gives me 200 plus strikeouts with really good ratios, then it's actually very advantageous to carry. Even if he, he hurts you a little bit, it's very advantageous to carry a, a high strikeout pitcher in addition, especially in this day and age where people, it, it, innings can be very hard to find from an individual pitcher. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the strategy is just, is moving. The target is moving so quickly with regards to pitching strategy because of the change in pitching roles that it's really hard to figure out. Um, you know, almost have to be ahead of the game, I think, to win right now. And all the stuff that we grew up thinking as far as, um, pitching norms and pitching standards are completely out the window at this point, yeah. which made, by the way, which made me so angry when, um, when people got upset over uh, Clayton Kershaw being pulled. Yeah. Right. Because do you want Kershaw to help you win a world series or do you want to celebrate with Kershaw for one day? I know that argument's been made a bunch of times, but this is a different time. You know, yeah. you had all these old timers chiming in about how angry they would have been, but this, it's not the same thing anymore. Yeah. I know it was this first start after a shortened spring training and a guy who had been nursing an, an arm injury in the right. last so there's a lot of context in that it was in the middle of summer. You know what I mean? Um, right. Well, so, and the teams know better. Like does, does the starter throw at hundred percent all the time? Does the starter throw at 80% all the time? There's, there's so many other factors than just leave them in or don't leave them in. No, I, I did hear the conversation with PPR and air and, um, and, you know, and yeah, and it, and it, it's a good discussion that you and I have had and, and will continue to have in, in this format as well of how to find value in the pitching landscape that we have. And to me, uh, as I've expressed, I think it's an opportunity to try to, to win on the margins because as fantasy players, we can either change the rules to try to match the game um, or we can complain and, and go fall about, you know, the lack of innings and, and, and wins and how hard those categories are to come by, you know, um, or you can adapt. And to right. me, it's honestly been something that I've really come to enjoy um, and just embrace. And again, we've talked about that in previous pods of how I've done that. But um, yeah, it was a good conversation. And I think, again, it's going to be one that we continue to have. I think for me in our league, you know, our leadership decided to address one of our rules to try to just acknowledge the landscape and lower our innings limit. You know, we used to have a minimum innings to qualify 40. And just knowing that and just acknowledging the landscape that, that we don't have as many pitchers pitching as many innings in terms of starters, they lowered it. I think it was, was, I think that was a wise uh, move, um, but to tandem that as well, we wanted to make sure we didn't have people just streaming uh, relievers and trying to take advantage of that. So they put a, a minimum of starts in and that's been, um, I've struggled to make sure I meet that requirement than, than I ever did with innings. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the best part of that is probably just my individual approach to building a team, but it's just been interesting. I didn't expect to have as much trouble or as big of an adjustment curve or learning curve with that rule mm -hmm. as, as I have now, granted, I've, you know, I've, I lost Patino pretty early on. Um, I, well, I feel like I've been pretty healthy, but um, yeah, it's just interesting because it's, you, you want, you change one rule, think you're going to get a certain outcome. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily realize, you know, what, what, what other outcome or what other result you may come with it. Right. So, anyway, I do. I think we've seen a market adjustment too, within the league with, um, uh, particularly starting pitching, the cost on starting pitching has gone way up. 
And I, I think it's a, a natural adjustment based on the rule changes that you, that you described. Um, I feel pretty lucky in getting a little bit ahead on that and, and acquiring both Wheeler and Rodon for first round picks and really is obviously as a backbone of the rotation, but it'll be like, again, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Right. I think everyone's adjusting on the fly and trying to figure out what all this means. It's been fun. It's been fun. Uh, so should we we'll go through our top 10, um, preseason catchers, and then we'll take a quick break and come back with the, uh, bit more of a deep dive into, um, what that list looked like and then what our list looked like, uh, currently. What was your, uh, we'll start from 10 to one. What was your, uh, list preseason? List preseason. Sorry. I was, uh, I had my trade sheet up. Let me pull up catchers. Oh, 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 you're right. You're right. Yeah. I really wanted to talk about some of the trades in our league. Oh man. I'm I sorry I jumped around there. It's all good. Let's go. Let's go. So, uh, first one. Yeah. Um, what's, what's one that interests you or do you want me to go first? Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, the first one I wanted to talk about, um, I think it goes in tandem with the conversation we were just having is uh, Spencer Strider was uh, traded mm -hmm. um, and and he traded for a draft pick. And to me, the reason that this interested me is um, his his role with the Braves seems to be in flux. There was momentum that he would be moving to a starter's role. And then within the last four or five days due to injury to Tyler Matzek, um, the, the manager there has come out and said, we see him more as a leverage arm because that's what we need right now. Um, I just think it's interesting, again, it just times into the conversation we were just having and about the pitching landscape. To me, um, this opportunity to acquire Strider was probably about an owner valuing his, his role um, and maybe another owner thought the value might change. So you know, based on what his role was gonna be and then it's shifting back and forth. Um, so I just think it's interesting to me that someone would be in, in position to move Strider. And I think there's probably a lot of owners out there, a lot of people playing fantasy that are thinking like, what am I getting out of Strider? And that uncertainty may drive them to want to go to strive for a situation where there's more certainty, where there are other owners that are gonna be excited by his potential. Um, I have his stuff plus pulled up here. Where are you at Spencer? Uh, so his stuff plus is 147 and his location plus is 100 despite an 11% walk rate and his pitching plus is 109. Um, and so you have, you know, you have this supremely skilled pitcher who only has two pitches is at most pitched four innings right now, but you see the talent. Um, and for me, you know, I'd be interested in acquiring Strider if I was in uh, a league where I could acquire him because he does have that potential to be a starter. But if, if they move into a leverage arm, he's already proven he can be an elite reliever. So I see value both ways. In terms of his career arc, I look at back to somebody like uh, Freddie Peralta. Um, you know, Freddie pitched out of the bullpen early in his career with, with the Brewers and was really a four-seam curveball uh, guy. He threw his change up nominally. And that's essentially where Strider is, but you switch out the slider for the curveball. Mm -hmm. He is fastball slider. Um, and... But essentially, it's the same kind of thing. It's a two-pitch guy who leans on his fastball to get swing and miss. Um, and I think his, his career could follow a similar arc. If you look at Freddie now, he throws five pitches. But it took him three-plus years within the Brewers organization to develop that. So um, I think there's that potential with Spencer Strider and to eventually become a starter. Or he may become a closer. We don't know. Um, but yeah, I just he's a fascinating player. And again, I think and in regards to the conversation we just had, a very apt uh, example of that. I think, yeah, I agree. I think that I don't, I, the place that I would challenge a little bit is, is whether he has um, a, has the potential or has the ability to get to a Freddie Peralta level. Um, because we can say that a lot of, with a lot of pitchers, if they develop that third pitch, they can, they can do X, right? Um, I see his value much higher as a reliever, especially currently. Um, I think he's a, obviously like you put, like you spelled out, he's a lights out reliever, fastball slider, um, especially with the SPRP designation. He's a, he's a pitcher that, that is of tremendous value within our league. Um, what I want to dig into just a little bit is that we have so many pitchers nowadays, um, with one, with a great fastball and a great slider, right. Or sweeper or curve or whatever it might be. And historically, we pegged them as 
relievers, right? You need a third pitch in order to be a starter. If you're right-handed and those are your two pitches, you're not going to be able to get left-handers out. There's huge platoon splits. We kind of saw it with Matt Brash this year. Um, although he has two different breaking balls, it was kind of a similar story against lefties. But I think most every pitcher has always been that way. And we're starting to see even more um, because the slider is of, of such high value now compared to um, the way it's been in the past. We're seeing so many pitchers who are fastball slider, which I, I would say is the second largest influence in seeing these three and four inning pitchers because the, the biggest one being health, right? Because pitchers are just maxing out their effort on every pitch and getting hurt all the time. The other one is if you have two pitches, it's pretty well known that you can get through the order once. You may be able to get through the order twice if you're elite, but it's incredibly difficult to get through the order a third time with two pitches. That's why you need the third pitches for variety. And so I just, I wonder what, you know, I, when I look for, for pitchers to invest in um, fantasy wise, young, young pitchers, I'm looking for, obviously everybody wants strikeout stuff and stuff is incredibly important, but what's the development look like on the third pitch? Are scouting reports saying that there's even some semblance of, of a average to plus third pitch. Um, and if there's not, you know, you're look, probably looking at a reliever or a three or four inning pitcher. And so again, the, the theme is baseball is just changing. Um, yeah. But I don't think that the two pitch, the elite two pitch pitcher at, you know, 18 or 21 years old is anything new, right? It's why Kirby was so attractive to me is because Kirby had great command and had more than more than two pitches. But I, I'm so fascinated to see where this goes and um, and how pitching roles and uh, pitchers like a Spencer Strider um, are valued moving forward, both within baseball and uh, fantasy. Yeah, in the dynasty league especially, I mean, you're just you're buying a ticket on that on that talent of those two pitches. Um, yeah, he, I mean, they're just not seeing him at all. I mean, his, his batting average on the four seam is 175, a 228 slug slider is 154 and 154. So he hasn't given up an extra base hit on the slider. Right. Um, yeah. It, and both of them have Supreme vertical break, which as we know, vertical break is, is more powerful um, and impactful than horizontal break. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were, there. if you were the Braves, what would you do with them long-term? What would you do with them? I would try to move him towards a starting role because I think the more the most the more impactful innings you can get, uh, the bullpen the bullpen pieces are replaceable. So I'd be interested in trying to see if, if we could get him developing on those two pitches, take those two dominant pitches, and try to become a starter. So again, I think in a dynasty league, you're just buying a ticket on that on that freight train anywhere. That to me would be a fun ride to be on. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll have to keep uh, keep tabs on Spencer Strider because I think I think we have a little different uh, perspectives on him, but I, I do think it's a great we test do. case for we sure. Do. We do. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back with a couple more trades and then um, launch into catchers. Love it. And we're back. Uh, a trade that I was offered last week. It kind of piggybacks on the young pitching theme. Um, my roster, Max Meyer, I was offered a first round pick for Max Meyer. That's after we keep uh, 15. But, you know, in the first round this this year, players like Seiya Suzuki were available. Um, and I couldn't accept fast enough. Uh, it's not not a knock on Max Meyer as much as it is. Um, I value that pick as far as giving the opportunity to acquire players down the stretch and um, I feel like there are a, a pretty decent number of really great um, starting pitchers in minor league baseball currently that uh, fit my team and that may be on a slightly different timeline than Max Meyer, but uh, can provide similar value once they're, they get close to being ready. Um, I was very happy with that trade. I don't, I don't think that uh, the trade was really imbalanced in any way, but I was very happy to acquire that round one in part because I have a list of 10 minor league pitchers that are starred that I, I would be excited to, uh, to pick up with the waiver claim. Um, really what I wanted to get at with, with the trade was just that there, it, I don't know that we're in a, 
a renaissance with or for uh, starting really good young starting pitching, but I feel like the depth and the number of potential superstars in the minor leagues is is growing. I love uh, so many of these young starters. And for me, that changes my fantasy strategy a bit because while I, I want to have I want to roster the individual pitcher that I want or that I fall in love with, it doesn't make as much fantasy sense to roster a particular individual pitcher unless you really think he's going to be great. Um, because there are 10 others that are very similar to them coming up through the ranks. Uh, how do you see minor league pitching in, as far as our league goes uh, with five spots, five minor league spots? And do you agree or, or have a comment on, on my perspective on that? Yeah, I think what's interesting um, to me, it, it's um, on both sides of the, the, the management, you know, that right before we, we anticipate Myers going to be up. So from your perspective as uh, the, the team that, uh, that had Meyer, his value is sort of tantalizing where if he comes up and he does really great. His value is going to go up. And if he has a couple of rough starts, it might go down, but he's in the news. So his value is good. And the, for the team, uh, for the manager who's interested in acquiring, if he really believes in him, he knows if he thinks, Hey, when this guy gets up, he's going to crush it. His value is going to go up. This is my chance. I got to get him now. Right. And so I find that from a management perspective, the idea, and I think that's something we see when guys get called up, their value is kind of at a, at a, at a peak point. And it's either going to go up or down. So I think, you know, it's just to me, like that manager was probably compelled, like they believe in Meyer and they had a chance to get him. And for you, you see a lot of depth and you're like, Hey, I'm never, I'm never going to be able to get a first round pick for him again. This is my chance. Right. So I think that's interesting from a manager perspective, you know, in terms of managing pitching prospects in a dynasty league, I think um, to me, I prefer to get guys who are closer to the major. So like for me, Ronzi Contreras is a good example. He's on my team. Um, I know he's close to the majors. He had a cup of coffee last year. I know that he's on, basically on the taxi squad. And he's going to get a chance this year. Um, and so that's the way I prefer to, to use, invest minor league spots uh, on my team because guys who are farther away than that, there's just so much risk of injury. Um, there's the skills and things are less uh, transferable to the majors. There's more, I think, more pitching development. We have more guys who aren't necessarily high pedigree players who have developed because of their own work that they put in at these F driveline and these other places that they go and they work on their pitches and pitching development. So we have guys who can, who aren't high draft picks, who don't say have pedigree, who can emerge and make mm -hmm. themselves great pitchers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just less, to me, it's less linear and there's just more volatility, not uh, because they get injured more often, not injuries, hitters get injured, but it's, it's a morality. I mean, young pitchers who throw hard, most of them end up getting Tommy John at some point um, or have other health issues that they have to deal with because of how hard they throw. So uh, to me, not being overly extended or overly invested in guys who are too far away um, or may maybe just because they were a first round pick and they're three rounds away, the chances of that guy not getting hurt, making it to the majors and fulfilling his, his potential, it's just really slim. And so the odds are in your favor. So I, pr I prefer guys who are closer, um, who I've seen, who I maybe have some data on, and if I'm going to invest in someone who's pretty far away, um, it's got to be someone who I think is, could be a phenom. Mm -hmm. I've also started looking for, so I agree with, with all of that, um, but if there's one special carrying skill with a pitcher, it is something that, and it's unique. I think those to me are the pitchers that are worth investing a little bit earlier, in a little bit earlier. Kirby is the example for me, the command is unique, right? And the command is something that is kind of the make or break skill for a lot of pitchers once they come up. And so given the fact that that command was there and you had the uptick in velocity, that to me, that was the time to invest. Um, but I, it's a really interesting point. I had not thought about the fact that um, pitchers have, it, with regards to fantasy, that pitchers have access to much better training and kind of process now than they ever have with something like driveline. And you can really develop uh, in a way that you couldn't previously add velocity, all of those sorts of things. And I think it's a good point that you can have a pitcher like a Kyle Harrison, right? That was drafted in the third round. Now he has, he's a left-handed starter in the giant system in, in low A ball right now, but he's 50% plus K rate currently. Somebody who I'd love to roster 
who I've looked at quite a bit, but he's a third round pick. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't that first round pick like a Mick Abel or an Andrew Painter who you immediately know because you saw their name in that first round. Um, but he's been able to, to really hone his craft in that way. So, yeah, I just, I think the point is just that there's this huge pool of pitchers with great arms and, you know, you want proximity. I want one carrying skill that might make them into a superstar. Obviously you want the superstar too, but you like to have a little bit more data, but it's, it's very, very, I'd love to sit down with all 16 managers in our league and ask, what is it that you look for in a pitching prospect? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would say with your favorite pitch count to you as a carrying skill. Like if they have a dominant pitch, would that be something that you look for as well? Yes, it, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So it would be, it would be that plus the, uh, progression of a second pitch. So someone like, <clears throat> as an example, someone like Matt Brash, who has this, you know, ridiculous breaking ball and which we thought he would be able to throw for a strike, but there's so much horizontal movement that it's hard for him to catch the plate. But his fastball, while it's 98, it doesn't have a ton of um, life, right? And it doesn't have a ton of live or rise. And so there, he gets similar results to his fastball as like a Hunter Green does. Um, previously, we would have just looked at the miles per hour and said, that's a great fastball. Right. You now understand that there's so many other factors that go into it. So, you know, I'd love to brash, in hindsight, brash would have looked like a better prospect to me if I would have been able to understand how much life his 98 mile per hour fastball actually had. Yeah. yeah. In, terms of, in terms of development too, I mean, you look at someone like Chase Silseth recently, um, he was a 12th round pick of the Angels and they kind of infamous, infamous, infamously selected all pitchers in their draft in 2021. And he's the first one to make it to the majors. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if they knew that he was going to be the first one to make it, wouldn't they have drafted him sooner, right? right? But the, the point is, is like all the things lined up for him whether whatever those switches and levers and in his in his development track, he was the one that was ready. Right. You know? um, and I'm sure all those other guys are working hard and they'll make their debut at some point. But um, yeah, just another interesting example of, of, of the more just sort of um, less wayward path than than the hitters tend to tend to see. Right. Um, I was going to say hitters I see in a, almost the opposite manner, which is if you're an 18 year old with, you know, with a really good hit tool and with room to grow and a semi discerning eye. And even if you don't have a ton of power at that point, you know, players really grow and fill out during between 18 and 22, you get into a, a major league nutrition program, you get into major league training, you're able to dedicate your entire day to playing baseball and not to school and all the other things. And with hitters for me, I think, really getting out in front of of that potential and getting that that hitter really early on in their career is the way to find superstars in a dynasty league i think we all know that but in my mind that that threshold is being pushed further and further out we have someone in our league who rosters david ortiz's son who's 16 years old in florida right but does that make sense? Yeah, I think there's some logic to that. If you if you can afford to to put him as your fifth minor league player and just sit on him, you know, there's there's some logic that he's already already has incredible talent and is the the likelihood of him becoming a major leaguer I think is pretty high. Um the likelihood of be, him being his dad is not very high. But um and he may have done drafted him in part for the novelty, but I I still love the pickup. It's yeah. the same thought process for me having Tamar and, uh, and, uh, Cam Collier. Yeah. All right. Do you want to cover any more trades or you want to move to catch? Yeah, I have, I have one more. I think that's super compelling just because, cool. um, both players I think are ascending and uh, players of interest. Uh, and then we had a, we had a trade of uh, two outfielders, Stephen Quan and Brennan Marsh. Mm -hmm. And I, I love, um, so much about both of these players and would be interested in rostering them. Um, and depending on my team construct in, in different ways. But to me, it's, I think, what you tend to call is a challenge trade, you know, because each of these players bring something entirely different. Um, and so I just think it's fascinating from that respect. Um, you know, Brandon Marsh is a power speed play. He's a plus defender, um, and he strikes out uh, too much to strike out rate this year. 
uh, 32%. Last year was 35%. Um, and he's walking uh, 7% of the time both years. Um, so that puts him in a pretty negative light in terms of strikeouts, but he's bringing 93 percentile sprint speed uh, and is already showing power to all fields uh, in his second year. And I think the underlying, the underlying data in his spray chart and location of his home run show you that he has legitimate power. Um, he also brings uh, a track record of in the high minor, starting with uh, starting in a low A all the way through triple A. He consistently ran double digit walk rates, so 13 percent, 12 percent, 11 percent, 22, and then 14 and a half in 2021 in triple A. So you look at someone who I think K's are always going to be part of his game. He's going to maybe get down to the mid 20s, but if he could increase that walk rate with his speed, what would that do for his on base and his run potential? Um, but really, at this point, he's a power speed play. As opposed to Stephen Kwan, who is just an elite hitter in terms of bat to ball, uh, his chase rate and whiff rate uh, and K rate are all in the 99 or 100 percentile. So he just has elite, elite bat control. Um, his K rate, K rate is 8.4 percent. He's walking 12.6 percent. I mean, that's just something we don't see that in 2022. Um, and uh, so he has, you know, if you look at his spray chart, he does have uh, four doubles so far. Um, but you know, he's, he's a contact hitter and he also uh, has a premium spot in the batting order, whereas Marsh is going to be down in the lower third. So you have the opportunity for counting stats, uh, with Quan that at least right now in their career arc, Marsh is not going to have that opportunity until he, uh, and cuts down on the case if he can. Um, so yeah, just two very different players, but I think both have really strong skills just in completely different areas. So I think it's a fascinating trade and it's fun to think about which one you would value more and in which context. That was going to be my my question was there's some that well my first comment is that there's so many layers to comparing these two players and you know which one would you want short term you know redraft which one would you want long term you know in my mind obviously you, you laid out the power speed versus contact and hit tool and the I, as much as I love Stephen Kwan and want to root for an Asian American baseball player. Um, there's what's interesting about him is is it's similar to having, you know, like a D Gordon or a Billy Hamilton on your team a couple of years ago where they got steals and nothing else. I think with Quan, he's obviously he's going to get you hits if hits is a category or average if average is a category. And his, you know, if you're in an OBP league, he's certainly valuable. But you have to surround him with power. You have to surround him with slug. You have to surround him with um, RBIs because he's not, he's really going to drag you down in those categories, whether it's uh, head to head or Roto. Whereas with Marsh, he contributes enough across the board, even currently that he can slot in pretty comfortably as in our league, as an outfield three. And if he continues to perform as he does, um, you can get away with that, right? If you slot Stephen Kwan in as your outfield three, you better be getting home runs from everywhere else. And RBI. So as much as I love Quan, I, I tend to value Marsh, I think a little bit more uh, for fantasy purposes. I like watching Stephen Quan play much more in person or on TV, but I, but I think Marsh makes your, your roster construction uh, much more comfortable and much easier. And um, we had discussed this on previous pods. I, I think that idea of looking for double digit home runs and double digit steals from most every position outside of maybe um, catcher and first base is can pr prove to be a winning formula if you can figure that out. And that's not to say that Quan's not going to hit 10 homers. It wouldn't surprise me if he starts to um, uh, show a little bit more power down the road as he gets more comfortable swinging a little bit harder. But for now, when I look at their stat lines currently, um, again, as much as I love Quan, I think Marsh is the, is the more comfortable play for me. Um, but who knows, maybe Stephen Kwan can, he can legitimately hit 320, 330. And I don't, I don't think that we would be surprised by that. Yeah. And that would be my only pushback. And that this is some, I mean, I, I like, have liked Brandon Marsh, have roster Brandon Marsh uh, in our Van Tracks League um, throughout his um, career and ascent to the majors. Uh, don't currently have him. Um, however, with that said, I mean, I think with Stephen Kwan, if you look at his, ceiling fantasy wise in our league context if he hits 315 and has 90 runs and has a 770 ops 
I, I think that could be an asset um, because if he's hitting with his walk rate and his batting average, he's going to stay. I think his floor is like a 700 OPS and on good years, he could be in the high 700s, even if his slugging doesn't improve too much, you well, know, what's your, what's your OPS threshold? Like, well, in, I guess coming into the year, what was your OPS threshold for your, for every player on your team? And given the context of, of offensive baseball currently, what would your OPS context be? Well, or I think, OPS threshold, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think 700 is kind of the Mendoza line for me. Like anybody that's consistently below a 700, they better be, it was not someone I really want to consider. But to me, in our league, in my experience, you've got to at least bring that unless, and, 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 or you're going to be a detriment to the, to the roster. Um, obviously, you want to shoot for much higher than that. I guess that's my point with Quan is if you're getting such uh, hits and runs impact, potentially, um, if, and if he's not hurting you in OPS, despite his lack of, uh, his lack of power, uh, might he be a, more of an asset? I don't know. Again, I favor Marsh, but I kind of challenge myself if I look at just looking at currently he's slugging 380, but his OPS is 750. Right. And, he, and, he's, a rookie, and he's a rookie. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like you, I just am not, wouldn't be surprised if he hits 320, 330. Right. And we know that Cleveland, uh, you know, look at Jose Ramirez's run production. We know they can produce runs despite the, you know, the inexpensive way that they manage their team. Right. My, my OPS, OPS threshold is, is higher. Um, for me, once you get below 750, I'm starting to look for other options. Um, 800, like if I was able, my, my best case, realistic best case scenario is to be able to look straight down my stats and see 800s all the way down, right? or 800 or more. And I do think that that can be realistic, um, but anything below 750, like Brandon Crawford, as an example, he's starting to heat up, but you know, his is 664 currently, and he's my starting shortstop. Now, there aren't a lot of shortstops out there to be had, but he's bringing me down quite a bit, especially compared to a lot of the other, a lot of the other players that I roster. Um, <laughs> but yeah, again, for me, that's my, that's my threshold. And I think we all have, different um, thresholds for each category, right? But uh, the way that plays into the conversation we just had about Quan is, I don't know that that Quan, there'll be times where Quan is going to drop below 750, right? And if he drops below 750, what else is he, what, is, what else is he providing? Um, that means that his on base might be slightly lower. That might be mean that his average is slightly lower. And if he's not getting on base enough to score runs, he's really not doing anything at all. Um, in a perfect world, he'd be a fourth outfielder for me, an outfield four that I would be able to plug in if I was behind in hits heading into the weekend and with matchups. Um, oh, he, yeah. would have, he was like second base outfield eligible and you can slide him in the two spots on the weekend. Then or, it, you know what I mean? that would completely change. I mean, that's not going to happen. And these are going to, or the guardians are going to put him on the dirt, but. <laughs> right. Well, but that's also an interesting conversation because some some managers value positional flexibility more than others, right? Like um, you and or you know I understand that you you value very you talked about it on past pods you very much value positional flexibility on your bench, and I look for I look more for players that I know are going to get consistent time at that position and if they have positional flexibility it's a um, it's a, a added bonus. Yeah. But for me, it's not something that I really value. Um, I don't know if, you know, one argue, if one argument is better than, than the other necessarily, but I, I do think that it's, it's just fascinating how we look at things so, so differently at times. Yeah. Well, I just think too, I mean, if you look at his, um, his profile and his potential profile, power potential, if you look at it in a second base context, I think it's a lot different than an outfield context. You're, you're giving, um, in a head had league, you know, you're, always, you're always comparing yourself to what kind of player or what kind of roster am I going up against, right? And that's that's it's head to head. So, um, so yeah, I think putting him at second base or something like that, his what you give up is would be looked at in a lot different light than in the outfield. Yes, outfield three in our league, you're looking for you know 15 to 20 home runs and 10 steals. And hopefully they hit high enough, high enough in the order that you get some runs in RBIs. 
Yeah. Whereas the second base, if you can get 250, 260 with 10 home runs and eight steals, I don't know. We were talking about um, it's just because he comes to mind, not because you had him. We think about Jonathan India. Mm-hmm. Right? He was someone who was kind of a 15 15 type of player. And people were just falling up, falling over themselves, trying to pick him up in the preseason. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I love this conversation. Yeah. And, and yeah, just for a reminder for our listeners, we, Tino and I play in our dynasty league is 16 teams had to had three outfielders. So okay. we're talking and having this conversation around strategy uh, in that context. As if you're talking about a five by five roto batting average, five outfielder league, I think our, our, out, our um, conversation might look a little bit different. Right. I, I would probably in that context, I'd probably value Quan mm-hmm. over over Marsh in part because I still have four outfield slots to be able to, yeah. to fill the other categories. Yep. Gives you more opportunity to balance it out. And what Absolutely. he brings batting average would be huge. Mm-hmm. And our league, our league tends to lean, um, lean power and speed as mm-hmm. well. Cool. Catchers, let's do this. All right, so my top 10 catchers preseason and uh, descending order were Kirk at 10, uh, Adley Richman, Sean Murphy, Hybert Ruiz at se- 7, Stevenson at 6, Wilson Contreras at 5, Ramuto at 4, uh, Sal at 3, Yasmani at 2, and Will Smith of the Dodgers at 1. Mm-hmm. Mine were uh, Mitch Garver at 10, Tyler Stevenson 9, Eight, Kiebert Ruiz, seven, Dalton Varsho, six, JT Realmuto, five, Wilson Contreras, four, Adley Rutschman, uh, three, Yasmani Grandal, uh, two, Will Smith, and one, uh, Salvi Perez. How do you feel about your list looking at it now? Yeah, so when I looked at it, um, I felt like my biggest uh, miss was Dalton Varsho. Uh, he was missing from my top 10. I had him at 11. Um, I doubted um, everyone presumed that he was going to get full-time run and that he uh, would run and he's, his hitting would be good enough to, to be an asset. And I was less certain about his, his skill as a hitter and also if he would have the playing time that everyone uh, thought he would have. And I was, I was dead wrong. He's proven to be a plus defender in center field. Uh, I think he's in above the 90 percentile and both outs above average. Um, and uh, I did not realize he had that sort of ability in the outfield mm-hmm. uh, to keep him on the field. And he, uh, he's, his slash on is 252, 326, 449, with a 775 OPS and a 119 WRC plus has six home runs and three, st- three steals. So he's, he's really delivering a balance uh, across the board and he's getting full volume playing time. Um, so I, I missed on that one. Um, and yeah, that's the defense and the volume that surprised me. And he's mm-hmm. honestly a little bit better, better with the bat than I realized. I don't want to say I doubted the bat. I just, I questioned whether it would be good enough to, to be worth the cost that people were paying and redraft. And I think he was, he was kept in our league. So that means he was valued pretty highly uh, in a dynasty keeper context as well, not just for redraft. Uh, my hit, I felt like was Tyler Stevenson having him at number six for me. Uh, I really believed in the plate skills and I, with the trade of Tucker Barnhart to Detroit, bring him up to uh, get full-time run at catcher, as well as the uh, designation of the DH in the National League, uh, knowing that Vado would uh, see some time at DH and that v- Stevenson has shown the ability to play first on those days as well. Uh, I just felt like he was going to have each opportunity to increase his playing time. And again, I loved the, the contact plate approach, and I believe he could unlock some power uh, just based on his ability as a hitter. Uh, he's proven so far he's, uh, he's excelling. He's 329, 390, 562. So for a 952 OPS and a 163 WRC plus, um, he's uh, selling out a little bit for power, which honestly, as a fantasy player, I'm okay with. If you look at his spray chart, uh, he's really tapping into full power. Three of his four home runs have been uh, to left, left field, and his, he has one to the opposite field. He also has four doubles, two down each line. Um, but I do think he's giving up a little bit of contact for a little bit of power. But also he has had two, um, two, two stays on the injured list due to the concussion issues. So um, his zone contact's a little bit down, his trace rate's a little bit up. But honestly, I just think that's lack of reps and being in and out of the lineup. I really trust that his, his eye and his chase rate, which are still about, above league average this year, uh, but last year he was elite. And I think he'll regress back towards that as he gets more consistent at bats. 
Um, but I really believe in the, the plate approach and the contact. And I love that he's getting into that power and I love his playing time. Um, so I think having him at six, I would probably move him up a little bit uh, today. Um, but yeah, I thought that was my best call. Awesome. Uh, my worst call, well, it's to be determined, but my worst call was Rutschman at four. I thought there was a good chance that Rutschman would start um, the season with Baltimore. I, I know how cheap Peter Angelos is. I thought that the, that they needed to bring some people into the stands and that he would want Rutschman to start the season um, there. He was hurt, but he's still not up in the majors. I do think that if he comes up pretty soon and he gets 350 at bats and um, hits the ball the minute he gets up, that he is a top 10 catcher. I don't know if I would, that he's going to end at number four. Uh, I also had Real Muto at six, and I don't like to be negative about players, but I think Real Muto has been um, overvalued for quite a while, uh, in part because he contributes some steals. Um, there can you can debate whether getting you know ten steals from a catcher is what kind of value that holds in a head to head. I think in a roto it carries a decent amount of value, but for us, I'm not sure. Uh, his currently his current OPS after 126 plate appearances is 6.58. Um, he does have three steals, but all of his batted ball metrics are, are pretty much below average other than his max exit velocity. Uh, and then my regret is that I didn't rank Wilson Contreras higher. I, uh, I compared him in a post, um, in a blog post preseason to Will Smith. I saw a lot of similarities in their batted ball profile and, um, I felt like Wilson Contreras was just getting a little bit uh, unlucky, but that the explosiveness and uh, the power and the hit tool were there. Um, they just hadn't really shown in, in its true light yet. And sure enough, this year, uh, Wilson Contreras is hit his slot triple slash is 277, 397, his OPS is 872. This is in 121 plate appearances. He got four home runs. His RBIs are down a bit because he's been leading off or hitting second. So he's got 10 RBIs, but he scored 20 runs already. Yeah. And he's in the hundredth percentile for hard hit. Uh, he's, I think for, for me, um, he's a player that I just, I've always really liked a lot. And then when I saw, when I read his or looked at his uh, performance last year, realized that he's an even better player than I thought. Uh, the only other ones really to touch on, I, I'm not the same believer as you and Stevenson. Um, in part because the the batted ball, um, the batted ball metrics are a little bit soft, uh, but I do I think that the park context really does um, play a role with with Stevenson, and that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, people got forty five home runs from Marcus Simeon last year because of park and because of his ability to yank the ball down the left field line. So it doesn't mean that he's not going to put put really great statistics up. It's just. I think if I'm looking at his just his skills, that's that's the question that I have. And then the top, you know, to talk about the top three real quick, um, I still have Salvador Perez presently at, at one. I understand that he's off to a bit of a slow start. His OPS is 655. I think that's brought down quite a bit because he doesn't walk much. Um, if you play in an OPS league like us, that's a consideration. But I do think he'll still hit 30 home runs. I think he'll end up with 100 RBIs. And I don't know that any other catcher will end up with those two numbers. So Perez does still carry tremendous value. If you were to re-rank, uh, where do you put these players now? Yeah, if I re-ranked re them today, um, I would still have uh, Will Smith number one. However, I would have Contreras at number two. As you pointed out, his, his hard hit rate, he ranks in the 97 to 99%. Uh, tile on exit velocity, max exit velocity, and hard hit rate. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, he's bringing uh, a power that the power that's kind of Sal Salvador Perez is bringing, but uh, with a better plate approach. I uh, still does have a little bit more swing and miss than Will Smith, uh, but he has honestly is is a better power player at this point. Um, and then I would have Sal third, and then Stevenson fourth. So for me, it's Perez one. Uh, Contreras to Will Smith three, um, Varsho four, and then you know I'm actually still debating uh, Rutschman five. I just think he's that much of a pure hitter. You're doubling. Yeah. What was that? You're doubling down a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> so 
Yeah, Perez, Contreras, Smith, Varsho, um, and uh, and Rutschman. I think that that if actually I should go back and look if I had Rutschman that high prior to the fen the news of the fences moving back or not. He is a switch hitter. Um, I think as a left as facing right handers, you know, he it, it's still a really great park to hit in um, in Baltimore. But yeah, I'll put Rutschman at five. I'll take that gamble. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Cool. Uh, are there any any catchers that weren't on that list that you think should have been um, that we didn't talk about at all? I guess a player of interest for me is someone that we we both have rostered. Um, I think both think decently of who we also ranked pretty high. His option there so sorry is Yasmani Gandal. Mm -hmm. he's, he's sort of a, a set cast um, OBP darling. You know he doesn't chase. He walks a ton. He, did, he has one of his better zone contact rates of his career this year. He's not whiffing as much, uh, and he pops on the hard hit in velocity, but um, he's just not producing much right now. So we have all these underlying skills and numbers, as he always has, to say he should be producing, but he's not already. Um, so he's someone I roster in our Dynasty League. I know, again, that he's a player that you've had, um, and we both, uh, both, I think, are fans of his game. So you know, what would be your perspective if you had him or – would you consider going out and trying to get him if you if you in a redraft if you didn't have him and you're trying to buy low or what's your take on where he is right now? Uh, I'm a little worried. I think he's older catchers break down. Um, I love the OBP skill. I I know the power the power is there. Um, he is a savant darling for sure. Uh, offense is good in in um, Chicago, but he's this is probably just a, a in the back of my mind that, you know, he was busted for PEDs. He's in his thirties and he's busted for PEDs young, early in his career. He's in his thirties and catchers break down. You know, I think that, that, that I would, I would prefer to uh, take a chance on some of the others unless I could get him almost for free. Right. If he, if he costs me a, a cheap minor leaguer or a decent draft pick, then I would consider it. Um, but until, until I see that, you know, he's, he's not on the decline. Um, he's not a player that I probably target anymore, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Yeah. It's an interesting study. I mean, at what point do you trust the production and you let go of underlying skill and track record? You know what right. I mean? It's a, it's a, it's definitely a balancing act. And I'm um, just uh, for my roster, I'm really thankful that I decided to keep Stevenson to make sure I had that um, to try to make, just buffer myself against having a replacement level catcher. Right. Um, it gives me, it gives me the luxury of waiting uh, on Grandal because he had a very similar start last year mm -hmm. um, and ended up by the end of the year, he was just mashing the ball. So uh, it gives me the luxury of waiting and I don't have to make a decision of cut or reacquire, but yeah. Right. I, I will say that, you know, so I roster Contreras and MJ Melendez and having the, um, the ability to essentially have a catcher in the lineup every day. You know, that's the hope at least yeah. six out of seven days and to be able to even play matchups at times with catcher. I know there's a lot of debate about whether to carry two catchers in a one catcher league because it's yeah. a valuable roster spot. But I, I, I can tell you right now, it gives me a lot of, I, I hate to say, say it in this way because it's very dramatic, but it, I can sleep well at night with my, <laughs> you know, because my catcher position is taken care of. Yeah. With Melendez and Contreras. Um, so in, in terms of your team, certainly I would keep them both. And I don't, I don't know that you could get fair value for either of them right now on the market. And so keeping them both, I think is the right play. One other catcher thought. I hadn't really dug into him. Um, he's not on my top 10 in either of the list, but I think if we would have completed a present top 10 list, I might've actually included Gary Sanchez, believe it or not. So Sanchez currently is hitting 230. Uh, his OPS is 766. He has four home runs, but his average exit velocity is in, in the 75th percentile. Hard hit is 85th, and barrel is 97th. Um, he does have a ton of swing and miss. You know, his 12th percentile K rate. Um, but I think getting out of New York has been a really po big positive for him. Mm -hmm. I don't think he'll ever hit over 240, maybe. Mm -hmm. But 25 home runs is in the cards for him. Yeah. You know, 35 doubles might be in the cards for him. And they're playing him at DH some too. So 
Gary Sanchez is, is one that I would look to acquire if I didn't have, if I wasn't set at catcher, I would look to acquire Gary Sanchez on the cheap, understanding that he may actually settle in to be 80% of the Gary Sanchez that we thought he might be going into his or coming out of his rookie year in New York. No, that's a great call. I love it. So we'll take a quick break and come back with our prospect profile and then a little bit of open forum. We're back. I'm going off script here. I've got two questions for you. I love it. I've got a comment and a question. The comment is I'm watching this Phillies uh, Padres game right now off to my right. And the old school Phillies uniform that they're wearing, the throwback that the baby blue with the, with the maroon P and the stripes down the side is so cold. That's one of my, I think, I think Von Hayes, when I see that uniform, but man, that uniform, like, I don't know why they don't wear that uniform every single away game. <laughs> it is so sick. Schwarber's up right now against Darvish too, but I just, I, it's, it's might be my favorite uniform in baseball. I love it. That's awesome. I love it. My other, uh, my question for you is random. If you were a baseball player, what would your uh, your walk up song be? <laughs> oh man, um, I want something without lyrics. I just want it to be music. I'm trying to think of uh, something that would represent well in a stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you mine. I'll, I'll give you a minute to think. I'll give you mine. Sure. Mine would be Cold Blooded by Rick James. <laughs> no joke. I think, would, I think it would be sick. You can give it to us at the end of the pod if you want. No, uh, it's so good. I'm going to change my answer. Instead of going to orchestra, I'm going to go to music I listened to when I was a kid that I think would make everyone smile. Uh, I would go Hollow Notes, Man Eater. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Awesome. I think every, when you hear Hollow Notes, you just can't not smile. At least I can't. Hollow Notes is so, awesome, man. You, you have to grow the mustache, though. You would only be able to do it if you grew the mustache. It remind me that I was a kid once and that baseball is supposed to be fun. It would get me in a good mindset to hit. I love it. See, for <laughs> me, good cold-blooded is just like just reminding you that you're a killer and right, reminding everybody that you're a killer. So funny. All right. Who's your prospect? My prospect is Ellie De La Cruz. Um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, he is uh, currently a high A, or a little background first uh, for people who may not be familiar. He's a 20 year old short shop, short stop. He's in the uh, Cincinnati Reds organization. Um, he was signed in 2016 from the Dominican Republic. Um, he was in uh, rookie ball in 21. And then he also played in, in low A in 21 as well. Uh, this year he's in high A at Dayton. Um, and so right now he is, uh, that is currently where Joey Votto is rehabbing. And I read a, I read a story the other day where uh, Votto got a single and then he got driven in by a cruise on a home run that left the stadium. Oh, jeez! <laughs> it said a ball hit 120, 112 mile per hours, 112 miles per hour off the bat was so high that the trackman system couldn't register the distance. For anyone in attendance, it was easy to measure the old-fashioned way by describing it. The ball cleared not only the fence, but the fence beyond the stands in right field, bouncing onto Sears Street, which runs behind the stadium. That's phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> and Vado said, he's obviously one of our better prospects in the organization, a ball that not many players in baseball can hit, period. And he's doing it here in A-ball. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Everyone has to walk the walk. But you see some things down here yeah um, so and uh, another reason that he was on my mind is this he's been really hot of late uh, he's had uh, three home runs in the last five games uh he's now slashing this year 276 333 533 with an 866 ops and that was after a really slow start um so he he's a super tooled up prospect he really emerged uh last year with his performance in low a um well, last year he slashed 296 336 539 uh, with eight home runs, 10 steals, and 61 games. He did strike out at 30 at 30 percent rate. Um, but scouts uh give him a 70 um for both power and speed. And his hard hit and battle ball data have been uh super eye-opening and super impressive. So um that's the player, you know, he's in the Reds org. 
Uh, he's being mentored by Eric Davis, who calls him a six-tool player because he's a switch hitter. Um, and he says that, you know, it's kind of a joke to say that, but he said with him, it's true. Um, and so he's a super competitive kid. Uh, he really, Eric Davis really believes uh, that uh, his competitive nature is going to allow him to excel. I'm a big believer in people who want to be great are the ones uh, who are great, who believe in themselves and are willing to put in the work. Um, I think that goes a long way. So he's a far away from the majors. He's not the type of prospect I typically am drawn to because of the risk in his profile. But I think for me, this represents a shift in how I want to invest my minor league spots and then also just embracing the fun part of, of this uh, process and dynasty of trying to take a few big swings, knowing that it might not amount to anything. Um, but if you're going to bet on someone, I like to bet on someone like De La Cruz. Awesome. That story is great about the home run. It's like God, a, it, Sid, it, made, it made me smile. Sid Finch style. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. My prospect is Miguel Vargas, 22 year old um, Cuban uh, in the Dodgers organization. He was signed by the Dodgers in 2017 for $300,000. He's 6'3, 205. He's currently a third baseman. Um, there's a decent chance that he ends up at first base. Uh, professional hitter, really, really, really good hitter. His hit tool is graded as a 60 by both um, MLB Pipeline and Fangraphs. There's a little, little disagreement on the power. Um, Pipeline had the power at 55. Fangraphs had his game power at 45 and his raw at 50. He's a bit of a plotter. Both had this, uh, his speed at 40. He's, he's not a stolen base threat. Um, he's not real agile. And so uh, that's part and parcel why he's, he's a third baseman currently, but might end up at first. But all he's one of those prospects that, that I like to say, all he does is hit the ball, right? You might not see, it's, he's kind of the opposite of De La Cruz in some ways in that you don't see the explosion. Um, his batted ball metrics in AAA currently are not, they're below average for uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, but he's a really skilled, skilled, skilled hitter. Could he hit 300 in the major leagues? I think there's a very high likelihood that he has multiple seasons as a 300 hitter. Last year in high A and double A, his triple slash was 319, 380. His OPS was 906. He did that in 483 uh, at-bats, so it's not a small sample. And he had 23 home runs, 98 runs, 76 RBIs, and 11 stolen bases. Um, those steals won't continue. I think a lot of that is, is instinct and it's not speed. Uh, his line in AAA currently is very similar. Um, in AAA Oklahoma City, it's 314, 418, 914. So he's, he's a hitter and yeah. I, there's going to be a place for him. You know, Justin Turner is kind of waning and, um, you know, Muncie is not always healthy. Uh, you know, they signed Freddie Freeman. I think had the Dodgers not signed Freddie Freeman, we may have even seen Vargas up in the majors already. But first base is obviously occupied now. But for me, he's a prototypical, I'd say, a five, uh, number five hitter. Um, you don't want him clogging up the base paths, but he can certainly drive people in. Uh, could peak Vargas be 300, 400, 900? Maybe. Um, I don't know that there's 30 home run power in his bat, but high average, lots of RBIs, maybe like, a, I didn't think of this comp earlier, but maybe like a, a Jose Abreu type, right? Mm -hmm. Where kind of old school production where you're getting a hundred RBIs every year and he's a consistent hitter and, but he's not pretty and he's not going to reach 35, 40 home runs. And so you don't think of him in the same way that you might think of a more demonstrative type of player but I do expect him to be a fixture in the middle of that Dodgers lineup for a good, you know, six years. Uh, the other comps I had uh, that I wrote down, but I don't know that I agree with anymore is one was Yuli Gurriel, but he walks entirely too much to be Yuli Gurriel. He doesn't chase in the same way, but right. when you think of high average, um, slightly less than average power at first base, he's the first one that comes to mind. The comp that I did come up with that I do like is Pedro Guerrero. So Pedro Guerrero was the first uh, third baseman and then a first baseman for the Dodgers and for the Cardinals in the eighties. But he was one that, you know, you would see the game winning RBIs used to be a stat that we would track at that time. And he was one that had a ton of them, him and Keith Hernandez and Pedro Guerrero was just clutch. 
He was super clutch hitter, tons of RBIs. Um, he did hit and steal a little bit earlier or hit home runs and steal a little bit earlier in his career. And he still was a 20 home run hitter, but he just didn't hit for a ton of power. But Vargas is one that um, I think is going to have an impact on the Dodgers lineup, is going to be a, a very, very good regular. I think that for them, even though I know their, their spending capacity is pretty much unlimited, I do think that they're going to try to find and um, and inject players like Vargas into their team who are going to be able to bring that payroll down a little bit, like kind of the next generation. And um, he's going to be the first one to be there. Him and Michael Bush will be the two that kind of anchor that, I think. But uh, interestingly, because of some of the, the lack of physicality from, from Vargas, uh, he was only the fifth rated prospects, according to Pipeline, in the Dodgers organization. And Fangraphs had him all the way down at 10. So there's something that they're seeing that doesn't quite translate um, uh, at the major league level. But I, I'm a believer. I like his stat line. I think he's a, um, a stat darling and um, potentially a low-end keeper in, in our fan tracks league. Have you been able to see Vargas at all? I have. I've seen a couple of his of his highlights this year um, mm -hmm. of, of, of bombs that he's hit. Uh, yeah, he's just uh, seems like a crusher. He's mm -hmm. he's right. He's right-handed only, right? Not a switch hitter. Right-handed. Correct. Yeah, I, I, love, I, I love the idea of like being like a five-hole hitter, like uh, especially in a deep lineup like the Dodgers. I think for for fantasy uh, in our format, that would just be such a premium position. Mm -hmm. I do wonder too. So one thought I had was, sorry, I'm excited. Jorge Mateo just had an RBI single and stole second. So nice, awesome. Uh, one thought is, I wonder if if the ball continues to not travel in the way that it is, and if we continue to or or next year if we don't see the shift anymore, right? That baseball is trying to put um, more emphasis on hits and less home runs and less strikeouts. Will a hitter like Vargas? carry more value moving forward because it's less of a three true outcome game, right? Those professional hitters, I think will start, will start to show up in a little bit different way. I'm, I'm upset that I didn't think of this when we were talking about Quan. Yeah. But maybe Quan is, has carries much more value in 2023 fantasy wise because teams can't shift. I don't think teams are shifting with Quan that much currently, Yeah. but he's able to put the ball wherever he wants a player like Vargas now with, with that kind of power, you know, you can't, sh with no shift, he's really going to be able to place the ball where he wants to. So just a thought, I'm not sure where I fall on that yet, but it was just a thought that popped into my mind that he may carry more, carry more value moving forward because of the change in offensive landscape. No, that's great. Cool. So we've got a little bit of time to do uh, either open forum or cards or both. Um, I kind of asked my open forum question. Just kind yeah. of not like it. Uh, what's your open form question this week? Well, I got an open form question to, to button up prospects before awesome. my series I'm looking forward to uh, this weekend. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about this year, and I guess I'm kind of rethinking how I want to invest in my minor league spots in our, in our league, and just for people who are listening, and we, we're, we have uh, five spots in our league that we can designate for players who have a minor league designation based on the rules our league sets up. And then when we keep 15 and at 15 at the end of the year, we can keep up to five of those players, obviously in that list. Um, and so I just, this is year five for me in the league and I'm still don't feel like I've figured out how I want to best use that spot. So um, I had a question for you. Um, so last year I chose to keep Andre Simenez uh, based on what he finished in 2020. Um, and he was traded into Cleveland in the off season. I saw him as a, uh, potential like 30 steel, multi-eligible, high average, um, uh, high in the batting order type bat first player. Uh, and that kind of, it was looking at sort of speed in, on my team. Um, and his prospect pretty was enough. I thought it warranted, you know, holding on to him. Uh, last year, he really washed out, um, got sent back down to AAA. I ended up cutting him. Um, so needless to say, didn't keep him this off season. And now this year, uh, he's slashing 323, 340, 552 with 892 OPS. He has four home runs, three steals. His barrel rate is 7%, which is league average. Uh, for a player of his position and stature, league average of barrel rate's pretty good. 
and he has a 42% hard hit rate and his sprint speed is in a 96 percentile. So he's delivering <laughs> on speed. They were platooning him earlier in the year, but he has um, shown enough that they are no longer doing that. He's moved up in the batting order and is uh, facing all handed pitching. And he's actually batting 274 against lefties this year with a 765. Uh, OPS against lefties as well. So my question for you is not what do you think of Andre Simonez because I know you don't like him. My question is, was <laughs> I wrong? My question is this. My I rostered form. him, by the way. Yeah, I did this year. For, for a minute. Uh, but no, and he's up to bat right now. So he is, the, I timing, see the timing is perfect. So my question is not what do you think of him? My question is, was I wrong about him or did I not wait long enough? Because that is really the question that I'm asking myself because I look at what he's producing now, and I think my, my ability to assess what some a player might be based on what I see, what I look at, is that was, that, was I not right? And the fact that I no longer have him, is it not that I've, my misevaluated, it's just I wasn't patient enough? That's my question. Was I wrong, or did I not wait long enough? He didn't wait long enough. And I know that seems obvious, but... I don't think it's obvious. I mean, I appreciate your honest I, answer. I think I think it is. I I, I think that he. Someone. So we we always say trust the process, right? Right. And I don't know how many hours. Think about how many hours you and I put into um, baseball and statistics prior to the baseball season starting, right? Like triple digit hours. Mostly because we enjoy it. Mostly because it's just like, it's like how we relax is sitting down with baseball numbers. And you have to trust it. If, if, you, were, if you were a manager who just kind of like would sort on fan tracks, would sort and see, okay, who has the best OPS at this position? I'm picking up that guy. Then I would say, you know, you're going you're gonna to win some and you're going to lose some. But because you put in the amount of work that you do and you thought about your keepers to the extent that you did. I just think you have to believe in them. You know, it might be a, a, a helpful tool to just set a, to set a drop dead date at the beginning of the season and just say out of all my keepers and my first five round pick, five rounds of draft, my, my top 20 players, I'm not going to touch until May 1st mm-hmm. or whatever it might be, right? To give yourself a guardrails to ensure that you don't cut bait too quickly. Um, And I think because we're in a head-to-head league, we actually have the um, freedom to sit on players for a while because we always have next week. Whereas in Roto, if you get down too far in in a particular category, I don't, it's hard to come back. So no, I, I think that your process was correct. I do think that if you felt like he could produce what he's producing right now or something close to it, that he's well worth keeping. Absolutely. I could very well be wrong on him. Um, I don't think he's a 30 steel guy, but I think he's a probably a 20, you know, maybe 2015 guy. Um, but no process wise, I think, I think you just have to believe in your process and stick to it. It's, it's, I think for me, naturally with my roster, there's a bit of churn at the bottom, but during the season, I don't make a ton of trades. And during the season, there's, there's no ch- very little turn with anything other than maybe my, my bottom eight players. Um, so, no, I think you cut bait too quickly. That, that much is clear. Um, but I don't think it was a mistake to keep him. And I think that your process is right. And Jimenez looks to be a, a fixture in that Cleveland lineup for you know the next five, six years. Um, I would, I think I would rather be, I would rather hold on to a prospect or a player too long mm-hmm. than cut them too early. And even if I'm cutting them too early, what am I getting in place of that cut? Mm-hmm. Right. I'm getting someone else that I'm speculating on because there's a reason why he's on the waiver wire. Mm-hmm. So trust that process, unless there's someone who you find who is performing at a really incredible level and you believe it. here's what I would do. If I'm going to pick up a player, is that player equal to or close to equal to the potential that I saw in a player like Jimenez when I was scouting him in the off season, right? Because that potential is still there. 
Mm-hmm. We're just, we're playing a long game. And sometimes it's hard to see because we're so drilled down into the details in our current, current matchup. Yeah. It's hard to see, but don't forget about all the work you put in. Yeah. That's a good point. So that's, that's my, uh, that's how I see it. I'm, I've been guilty of cutting many a player too early. Um, I may rue the day that I cut Bobby Miller. I may rue the day that I cut Christian Vaquero, but you know, I needed that spot. Yeah. We only have so many. Right. So my, my series I'm looking forward to this weekend, um, starting tomorrow through Sunday is the uh, Padres at the Giants. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, basically have identical records. The Padres are 23 and 14 and the Giants are uh, 24 and 15. Um, second and third place in the NL West, showing the Dodgers. But uh, yeah, two key, two teams uh, that are really compelling to me. The Giants are kind of at the forefront of w- what they do from a platoon and pitching development perspective. Um, and then the the Padres to me are just leaps and bounds better with Bob Melvin at the helm this year. They just have a completely different feel. Um, and I also have several other pitchers, so I'm just paying more attention to them this year. So the pitching matchups this weekend are Manaya and Junis on Friday. Uh, and then thank goodness we're not playing each other this weekend on our, on our dynasty league Musgrove versus Verdon on Saturday. Nice. Um, so that's going to be a, that's going to be a hell of a matchup. And then on Sunday it's TBD versus Alex Wood. Uh, it would be lined up to be Clevenger start. Um, but they so far they pitched him on six days rest and they did some piggybacking this week. So um, they had, um, Mackenzie Gore followed Clevenger on Tuesday this week, and then they had Nick and um, it's not it's not Nick Gonzalez. Who's the Nick uh, Martinez? Nick Martinez. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had him follow Snell on Wednesday. So it'd be interesting to see what they do uh, on that Sunday game from the Padres' starting pitcher perspective. But yeah, I'm just excited to see this series. It's in San Francisco, which is a great uh, venue to watch a game at uh, on television. Um, enjoy the radio broadcast for both of these teams. So all around, it's a win-win-win. I'm excited to see. Uh, this series this weekend and especially the Musgrove road on that's going to be really fun to sit down and text you while it's while it's happening <laughs> for sure that's uh have you seen games at those parks not live no they're both it's on my list though I can't wait they're both incredible I you know I wasn't I wasn't in love with Petco I don't know what they call it now um I thought it was I think part of it is just because it's in San Diego that makes it so great um, and so it's, it's warm and it's fun. And uh, the park itself, the architecture of the park, the, the sight lines, I didn't totally love. You know, the, the brick building in the background in left field is very cool. Um, San Francisco is just is gorgeous. Of the new parks, it's my, probably my favorite. Um, interestingly, it was built on a smaller plot of land because it was privately funded. And so it feels a little more vertical but it also feels a little bit more intimate than most parks do. Um, but that's, yeah, it's probably my favorite new park. Mm. So I've got two series, uh, the obligatory Mariner series, of course, uh, in part because it's so Mariners play at Boston starting today. It's four game series. Uh, what's that? The Sox. That's right. So George Kirby is tonight against Rich Hill, uh, Robbie Ray against, um, the uh, formidable undecided on Saturday, on <laughs> Friday, uh, Flexen against Whitlock on Saturday. And then Sunday is, let me bring it up real quick. Sunday is Logan Gilbert against Nathan Eovaldi, which I think is going to be a great matchup. There you go. There you go. Um, so I've, obviously I've got three of the four Mariners uh, starters in my fantasy rotation. So I'm always glued to those games. Um by the way, the Peacock matchup should be fun. Cardinals Pirates. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the other series that I'm excited about is White Sox Royals. Um, I always or try to watch the White Sox if I can, just because I uh, obviously a Yuan Moncada fan. But MJ Melendez is quickly becoming um, one of my favorites uh, to the point where I actually, I hope nobody hears this, I actually uh, considered for two seconds, I'm um, putting Wilson Contreras on the market um, because I, I'm i finding myself playing Melendez over Contreras, even though it's probably not the smart move to make because I want to watch him. I just, I love his swing. I love his swag. That uniform is is sick. Like the whole, the whole bit is just cool. So 
I love what? their safety neck uniforms. I hope they wear those again. They are so cool. They're White Sox Royals will be will be um, uh, a series that I will have on um, side by side with the Mariners this weekend. So it's uh, shapes shaping up to be a really great baseball weekend. Uh, super. Do we, get super another, do we get another C start this weekend? We do, don't we? I think so. Uh, I can. I have it right here. White Sox. Cueto is pitching Sunday, which would be fun. Um, Saturday, the 21st, the White Sox play against – so Kopech pitches Saturday. Oh, okay, so we're not going to get so – I don't think we're going to get – we're going to get another C start, unfortunately. Oh. Um, he's fun to watch, too. Yeah. He's super, super fun to watch. Yeah, let's watch. It's it's fun, and we've been competitors um, and, and peers so long. It's, it's fun to come manage a team with you and be able to root for the same guy on the same day. I agree. I agree. Uh, any cards? Are you into the cards today? Not today. Not today. I want to do matchups. I need to call it. Okay. I can, let me show you a couple cards real quick that I, that I found in a box. All right. So I've got a Bo Jackson Diamond Kings Don Russ from 1989, which I know is not worth anything, but I loved. I've got a 95 Fleer Rich Monteleone. I don't know if you remember him. I do not. He was a Mariners reliever. I've got a, I think this is 88 Fleer, Mickey Brantley on the Mariners. Shows you how old I am since Michael Brantley is a, currently a major league veteran. <laughs> um, and then what year is this? This is a, shoot, I can't even see. Maybe it's because my eyesight is bad. I found a Johnny Bench card. Oh my. So it's a Fleer Johnny Bench, which is kind of cool too. Yeah, that's great. Um, but I, I was just going through some old stuff and found some cards and started looking at them and I, uh, I thought they were cool. So I wanted to share. Thank you. You got anything else? Nope. Awesome. It's a good chat with you, man. Yep. Talk Saturday. Yes, sir. Peace out. All right.